River West Algiers Point. So named because the neighborhood juts out into the river. To the casual observer, it resembles an old-fashioned river town with houses and streets hardly altered since the turn of the century. Originally, Algiers was part of the property granted to the Company of the Indies by the French government in 1717. When Bienville founded New Orleans in 1718, he claimed a portion of what was now known as the King's Plantation, also founding what would eventually become Algiers Point. No one's quite sure how Algiers got its name. It grew to become a city of hamlets, small communities, each having its own identity. One story has it that a hamlet was named in honor of Stephen Decatur's defeat over the pirates of Algeria, which became legendary. By 1840, the hamlets came together and the entire community was known as Algiers. Algiers owes a great deal of its early growth to the railroad industry. In 1852, the New Orleans, Opelousas, and Great Western Railroad was formed. Beginning as a passenger service with a route only 17 miles long, service was soon extended to the Pacific Coast via Texas and was renamed the Louisiana and Texas Railroad. Huge railroad yards were built, extending from the river to the Orleans-Jefferson Parish Line, a distance of 22 blocks long and two blocks wide. By the time of the Civil War, Algiers had also developed into an important shipbuilding and maritime repair center. It would be known as the City of Docks. There were about, uh, about the, uh, I would say around about 20 some odd dry docks, 25 dry docks down there. But they all were well known. They were so well known that during the Civil War, that was one of the objectives of the Federal Fleet. Let's get to Algiers and stop them from building all those warships there. There's no more shipyard activity in uh, upper or old Algiers. I think that's because by choice they would ra rather keep that more residential. Now that the railroad and shipyards are gone, old Algiers, or Algiers Point as it's known, is indeed becoming more residential. In 1978, the area bounded by Atlantic Avenue, Slidell Avenue, and the Mississippi River was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. But with the city's economic slump in the early 80s, many people lost their jobs and relocated, leaving houses empty and falling to ruin. Today, Algiers Point is coming back through the efforts of the Algiers Point Association, a neighborhood improvement group, and people who are moving into Algiers Point. Today, we have some, also some great leaders in Algiers Point helping to put it back on the map. The friends of the library of our Alge old Algiers library um, have been a, a major part, too, of helping revive Algiers. And all the people that have moved in from out of town and people that have moved in back to old Algiers. But there's been great restoration of houses, um, and there's been a lot of marketing of our preservation. We're very, very deep in, in history and architecture and our, um, I guess, our great emphasis on historic preservation. Algiers has always had that emphasis. On almost every street, one can find beautiful reminders of the past. Most of the houses were built between the years 1840 and 1900, and the architecture ranges from Greek Revival to Queen Anne and various Edwardian revivals. Martin Berman, five-time mayor of New Orleans, lived in Algiers Point. Less than a year after his fifth term started, Berman quietly passed away on January 12, 1926, in his home located at 228 Pelican Avenue, which has since been restored. Another recent restoration is on Pacific Avenue and was featured on the PBS series, This Old House. Preservation efforts have also included such local landmarks as Photos Folly, Algiers' most popular movie palace and vaudeville house, once owned by Philip Photo. Through adaptive reuse, it is now the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle. With the help of the Crescent City Connection Bridges and the Algiers Ferry, both which link Algiers to New Orleans, along with a slow but steady upswing in the local economy, hopes are high for Algiers. This will become the Salsalito of America, the new Salsalito. I think will be as lovely an area to come and visit, both to shop and to visit, sightseeing. It'll be as, as big a part of our tourism as anywhere in the city. I don't have a greater love for any, you know, for anything in the city than Algiers. <laughs> Thank you.
And now, with today's Channel 4 editorial, here is Phil Johnson. Good evening. A very special tribute will be paid to a very special man this Friday, across the river as they are wont to send New Orleans, in Algiers. The man is Richie Dixon, who has worn so many hats in his lifetime that he could provide inventory for several stores. He has been reporter, interviewer, administrator, public relations man. Many of us know him best as the longtime manager of the Municipal Auditorium for over a decade. The only man who made all the carnival balls, all of the time, for all those years. Others would know him as one of the founding fathers, with the late Johnny Brechtel and Lester Lautenschlager, of the New Orleans Recreation Department. But if Richie Dixon is to be known at all, it will be as a historian, indeed as the premier historian of Across the River, of Algiers. Richie Dixon knows more of the romance and lore of Algiers than any man alive today. He already has written several books on Algiers and has still another in the works at the present time. He knows the history of all the old houses and all the old families. He not only knows where the skeletons are buried, but at times who put them there. He is, in a sense, a genuine treasure, a link with what was to what is and all in between. He will be feeded at a dinner Friday night at the Lakewood Country Club. Most of Algiers should turn out to pay him honor. Good evening. This has been a statement of opinion by the management of WWL-TV. If you disagree, we invite your reply. In capturing the essence of St. Patrick's Day, Budweiser honors the arrival of the Irish in New Orleans in the early 1800s. Many of the Irish worked on large and dangerous construction projects like digging the new Basin Canal amidst a yellow fever epidemic. And their prosperity fostered the building of St. Patrick's Church on Camp Street in 1833. For their many and various contributions to New Orleans, we salute the tradition and spirit of the Irish this St. Patrick's Day. Brought to you by Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch people this week, but across the river, the loss was even more tragic. Algiers lost its voice. Richie Dixon died this past Monday. Now, some will remember him as an early stalwart of the New Orleans Recreation Department. Some will remember him as the longtime manager of the Municipal Auditorium. But I remember him most as the best and brightest champion Algiers ever had. Ever since the time of Martin Berman, people and politicians have talked and postured about the future of Algiers, which was nice. But Richie Dixon did something much more important. He gave Algiers its past. In a landmark publication 11 years ago, his book, Old Algiers, breathed new and vital life into that long-neglected, long-dismissed part of New Orleans. He showed that the only difference in the history of either was that one wound up on the west bank of the Mississippi, the other on the east. He lovingly told of the magnificent plantation houses of the west bank, equaling in charm and character any of the fabled homes on the other side. Algiers had its share of heroes and charlatans, of triumphs and disasters, and of great men. And Richie told their stories eloquently and passionately. In truth, he was more than he seemed. He was a closet intellectual, proudly telling the story of the place he loved best. And equipped like no one before or since to telling it honestly and well. We should all mourn Richie Dixon, Algiers most of all. He provided for its future by showing us its past. Jim Henderson and meteorologist Dave Barnes. This is Louisiana's news leader, Channel 4's Eyewitness News. Good evening, this is the 5 o'clock news for a Tuesday, December the 31st. Memories of 1991, that's the topic of tonight's editorial from Phil Johnson. Good evening. 1991 was one of those quirky years. The good news, bad news kind of year. The bad news was war, war in the Middle East, desert storm. The good news was we won it, hands down, in less than a week. The bad news is that Saddam Hussein survived and is still in power. The good news is that the Soviet Union is no more, a victim of man's eternal desire for freedom. 
the bad news is that freedom had a price. Food shortages and higher costs for everything. But the world is helping. The good news is the Cold War is over. We won. The bad news is we're still spending billions for weapons, as if nothing had happened. What a waste. The good news is the president finally admitted we are in a recession. The bad news is that he ignored it for so long. We lost a lot of good people in 1991. We lost Dr. Seuss and Martha Graham. We lost Isaac Bashevis Singer, a storyteller without peer. We lost Miles Davis, the jazz virtuoso. And Margot Fontaine, the very definition of grace and beauty. We lost Harry Reasoner and Red Fox. Pianist Rudolph Serkin and Dr. Edwin Lamb who invented the instant photograph. Here at home, we lost former police chief Henry Morris, Joe Gemelli. We lost Richie Dixon, who wrote the history of Algiers with love and a rare scholarship. We lost Brother Martin, Joe Dorignan, Mrs. Martha Masson. And at WWL-TV, we lost Sid Urban, a friend and a man for all seasons where news was concerned. 1991, good news and bad news. We can only pray that next year we'll have more good news. We can use it. Thank you.